Okay, so welcome back to the 2023 Physicist Virtual Workshop and Hackathon. Uh, and thank you for rejoining us here. This is session five, where we're going to take the model that we just built in session four and start extending it to add a little bit more biological functionality and also to take an opportunity just to showcase some of the built-in reference models that you can use in your own models. Uh, I suspect that this session will also run shorter than anticipated just because these models are a lot easier to build than they used to be. Uh, and we can certainly attack that great problem when we get there. Uh, so the goals for this session is to continue building familiar familiarity with the built in physical cell models, in particular, working on drug response, phagocytosis or cell predation, uh, transformation, and rules that can be applied to dead cells. And by doing, and actually we will do this by continuing to build upon our previous model, uh, where we already have a tumor growth model with mechanical feedback, with oxygen-based uh, cell cycle entry, oxygen-based cell necrosis, and a hypoxic response, uh, as I recall. So we're going to continue building this out now. So uh, remember, uh, if you're just joining us here, uh, the assumed directory structure is that you have a physical cell unzipped somewhere in, in a directory. I have it in my root directory, in my home directory. And then somewhere alongside at the same level, you have physical cell studio and you can either rename this to something easier to type, or you can do a symbolic link to it. So I just do a symbolic link uh, so I can get into it. And so, and just recall that you can go into the physical directory, you can resume. Uh, so if, if you're just joining us here from the last session, uh, and if you've downloaded our code, you can actually go ahead and load our saved model. And so you can go and unzip. So if you go into um, user project directory, and if you save the zip file here from our last project, you'll be good to go. You can type make, unpack, and then the name of the project, in this case, is going to be session 04. And that was the last one we worked on. I'm going to overwrite my own model, my own model in this case. And then you type make load that project. So now we've populated that project where it belongs. You really shouldn't need to recompile, but I'm just going to do it for, for safety's sake. And we are good to go. Now that project has been loaded and we should be able to continue where we were last time in Physicel Studio. You know, I'm going to go ahead and just quit Studio and re-enter it just to be safe. So I'm going to type Python dot dot PC Studio bin studio.py. I'm going to do a little ampersand just so that it opens in a child process. I can still type things in this window if I need to. And we should be here. Well, I guess I need to manually load the user project. That's really funny because I thought I already had populated that project, but that is fine. So here I'm just going to browse and select this project. And that does not appear to be the project that I built. So I am actually a little bit baffled here. So Paul, when you did the load user project, how did it come up again? So I went here to file. Well, first of all, I just opened in my own directory. Now I'm going to go open load user project and go into my user projects directory. And this is the one I want to load. And it says it copied everything. And now I'm supposed to use file open to load the config file. Oh, I see. It pays of read directions, doesn't it? Okay. So hopefully now we should be back where we started. So we have all of this. We need to click on enable to load the files. No, it's not really showing up. This is not the project I worked with. I'm going to quit this.
and try again. No, I have no choice but to do what I said I didn't want to do. Okay. Well, I'm gonna load it the, my own way. Going to config and load my project. Yeah, well, I'm a bit at a loss here because my project is not loading correctly. So I, I don't know what all is going on with the load user project, but can you confirm that in your config, business cell settings, XML, that it's really the one with the, uh, how would you check that? The, instead of substrate, it would have oxygen or? Oh, even though I loaded it, it's not there. I think one issue might be when you're um, when you're starting a PC studio, if you don't specify the config file, it'll create new ones for you that are empty. Mm. And so that might be overwriting your config files. Oh. But I've now loaded that file. Okay, so when you start the studio, just do a dash. Yeah, go ahead and con confirm that. Well, right now it seems to have nuked my project. I'm gonna make my list of my user projects. So now I've loaded this project. So here I am doing it manually right now. That's well, definitely not my project. So maybe my project actually got overwritten. Let's do version three of this. None of these are actually loading correctly. That's not good. That's right. So the CSV the CSV file looks correct from the last one. So I'm going to go ahead and manually look at this XML deep, deep? file. Or if you have it on Git, then you just can reset it to the left, to what you have for the upload. Well, that's what I thought I had done. It's weird. So when you do git status and then git reset or something. Yeah. This backup one might actually just do the trick. Get out of my way. Thank you. 
so here we're looking at the XML version of the digital cell line here. And I'm trying to get this over to take a look at. Oh, this is not even our project. This is something way different. So let's see here. I betcha. So this is a bit more mangled than normal, folks. Don't worry. One of these days, I'm going to alias all of my typos. So all my typos work. This one. It looks to me like what appeared in the studio never actually wrote correctly to the XML file. And we've run into this problem from time to time. Another thing is I might save the template XML file instead of the physicel settings file. Template X? Uh, the, yeah, the template.xml file. So, for example, so here I am. Oh, thanks for that point, Max. Right. This whole studio is making different assumptions than I do, and that's why I didn't understand what it did. I think it are actually all good. Make load prod equals project let's see session 04 4. So we've done this, and you're absolutely right. It, I think Physical Studio is saving a place that's not our default configuration file. And so it is operating on different assumptions that I'm used to, and it actually saves to template for some reason instead of Physical Settings. And now we have truly loaded our project. Thank you so much, everyone. So yay, community. Um, so that is helpful. OK. so. We are now where we left off last time, that we have the microenvironment with oxygen with some different boundary conditions. We have our cell types, which indeed have apoptosis and necrosis. We have all of our rules. So this actually has opened up very, very gracefully. It doesn't load all of our initial conditions right now into the GUI, but we still have our original initial conditions. Now, if we want to, we could just basically redo it. We can start with zero to 200 and a hex fill plot and save it and make sure we're enabled. So we are basically now where we left off last time. So uh, slight panic aside, we are, we are now ready to go. And so uh, let's do this. And let's go ahead and add on the extra step, make sure to open um, Big. And since this right now insists on overriding template, that probably means that we have to change the ordering. You better open Physical Studio first. And this is not. Okay, and then we resume the last. Then we compile it. And then studio. Okay, and this will probably re keep continue to refine over time. Uh, it's just uh, it's 
actually perfect. It's just not what I expected is all. Okay, so we are where we started now. So that is fantastic. And so what we're going to do is we're going to continue building this model now, and we're going to add a cytotoxic drug. So um, the idea is that we're going to add a diffusible substrate into our environment. So we're going to add an extra environmental substrate. And so the first way to do that is to go into studio here and go to microenvironment. I'm going to add a new diffusible substrate. I'm going to double click it and rename it just to the very unimaginative drug as its name. And I'm going to just give it a very low diffusion coefficient of 1600. And I'm going to pick a decay rate of 0 0.002 minutes inverse. And this is actually set uh, based upon reading some literature on how quickly doxorubicin is cleared from tissue in about 30 hours. So I say, oh, if it's mostly cleared in 30 hours, let's call that three half-lives and ended up with this parameter. So my decay rate is 0 0.002. And I'm going to set the initial condition of 10 with no Dirichlet boundary conditions, so zero flux conditions instead. Oops, which means I actually need zero here, an initial condition of 10. So this is like an initial bolus of drugs. Okay, so we've got that. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that that drugs actually, that it actually enters the cells, just so we can get the, the proper drug gradients. So if I go here to this cancer cell type and go to secretion, I'm going to down, drop, choose this drop-down menu. And notice that the new substrate now appears over here. So I'm going to go here on drug. I'm going to choose an uptake rate of one. Okay. And let's go ahead and do that. And we can go through. So now we have a drug uptake rate of one. So notice by the diffusion length scale, right, that if I go here and I take the square root of this diffusion coefficient divided by the uptake rate in the well-packed tumor tissue of one, again, end up square root of 1600, which gives a 40 micron drug diffusion length scale, which is not that far off from something you might see for drugs, for larger drugs. Okay, and now we're going to add a response. So let's go here to the rules tab, and we're going to go here and select cancer cells. And here, the signal is drug, and the drug is going to increase apoptosis. Okay, so we're going to assume that apoptosis increases my death rate by a factor of 100. So I'm just going to delete two zeros over here. So it should be yeah, 5 times 10 to the negative 3. And I'm going to leave a half-life of 0.5 because I'm basically using a non-dimensionalized drug or something. and a hill power of four, so I can kind of plot out this response model. And I've got this. So as my drug level goes up, my death rate goes from the very, very low initial value uh, to a much increased initial value. And let's go ahead and click on Add Rule, and then make sure that we save it, and we're ready to go. And so let's go ahead and go here to the Run tab and click on Run Simulation. And Randy, thank you so much for uh, placing uh, extra help on the studio. And I really apologize for not fully knowing it. And uh, thanks for everyone who tried to correct me on it. And uh, that was a few steps behind. So let's go here to the plot tab now. And let's change our visualization to the drug level. I'm just going to click on one arrow to kind of advance the time. So you can see this initial bolus of 10 in the drug. and then you can turn off the cells and you see that's really, you know, definitely being consumed. Look for brown cells are necrotic and black cells are uh, apoptotic. So let's pop the drug in this and just hit play. And we can see that, oh, well, we, we nuked a lot of cells. We basically killed everything off here. So uh, very effective drug. So let's go ahead and hit stop. In fact, you can see that the total agent count is zero. We didn't even need to plot to see that. So that is quite an initial bolus of drug. I'm going to make sure that we got that uh, the way we expected it to. So we have this initial uh, death count here. And I want to go back and double check our rule. So drug needs to go to 5e negative 3. I think I did my death rate just a little bit too high. Yeah, that's 5e negative 2. No wonder. So I'm actually going to edit my rule over here. I'm going to go and double click this. 
and do 5e e negative 3 as my value and just click save again. And then I'm going to rerun it here. Because we pretty much killed everything right away. It was a very effective treatment. So now you can see that we're getting a lot of death initially, but some of the cells make it through and the drug has uh, decayed, you know, basically washed out of the system after several hours. So we kind of see that, that bulls effect and then whatever's left is gonna start recovering and start repopulating the tumor. Well, let's put back in that more fun condition on oxygen, take this down to like five and five now. Well, I suppose we'll leave it where we found it. Okay, so if we keep plotting, you can see that that drug now start to kill off some of the tumor cells and uh, the rest is left over as the drug is washed out now to start repopulating the tumor. So we have uh, some cells that made it just by stochasticity. And of course, it's an increasing drug effect, right? If we were to go and hit stop, we can go over here to the microenvironment and go to drug and we could change the initial condition to a lower value, for example, and click on run. And now, to go back, you'd see that, you know, we killed a few cells, but not too many, right? We're getting way closer to our half max now. And so between the fast, relatively fast decay rate of the drug, we have it being removed from this tissue, and uh, the much lower dose, we really don't get a lot of death here at the beginning, and it, it washes out before it can have a big effect. So that is that. Okay, so we uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go and change our initial condition back to 10. So we can kind of be synced up with where we are in our model. But we've already added now a cytotoxic drug to the model. And we plotted it and we kind of see that initial wave of death. And uh, there are some uh, add-ons in the community that can do some interesting things with drugs, like uh, the physical platform in particular, and physically PKPD, as I recall, uh, can actually have... Uh, drugs that are modulated by actually varying the boundary condition to model like a far field condition and vary those in time. So there's some neat things that you can do uh, with some the community add-ons. Okay, so now we have, you know, our original tumor growth model populated and we have a, um, uh, a drug that's acting upon the cells. Now what I'd like to do is to look a little bit more at the dead cells and have them release some debris into the environment. And so, uh, this is actually not too bad. We're gonna go into the uh, environment tab again, and we're gonna introduce a new diffusible factor called debris. And let's see here. Debris is like big cell particles, you know, apoptotic bodies, things like this. So it should have an extremely small diffusion coefficient. So I'm gonna give it one. So it just barely diffuses over time and no decay because, uh, Really, it's going to be up to macrophages pretty soon to be in the environment and absorbing uh, and, and consuming the debris in the environment. So we're just going to add that for now. No decay, no removal, no initial condition, uh, no fixed boundary conditions. We'll just have zero flux. And now we're going to go over to the cell types. And what we're going to do is we're going to start preparing the dead cells to release the debris. So one thing that needs to happen is go here to the secretion tab and choose now debris from the dropdown. And we need to set the debris, the, the target to a non-zero value in that differential equation. So that when we turn on that term in the PDE, uh, that we have a non-zero release rate of debris and it's trying to bring it up towards the target value of a non-dimensional one in this particular model. So we need to make sure that you said that this is a, a common mistake in modeling right now is forgetting to set the target to one or to a non-zero value and turning secretion on and not, not seeing it in any effect is because we didn't have a non-zero term in our PDE. Okay, and now let's add a rule. And so our rule here is that we want dead cells only to be releasing debris. So we're gonna go here to cancer cells and here the signal is the state of the cell. This cell is dead. And if they are dead, that is going to increase uh, debris secretion is what we'll call that. And dead is a Boolean variable. It basically has a value of either zero or one. So we want 
a rule that changes very, very steeply to be zero response when the cell is alive or dead is zero. And we want it to be basically 100% when you reach a dead cell of value of one. So a half max of one is uh, one half, which is halfway between true and false, makes sense. Oops. But we need to uh, set a saturated value. So let's just say that, um, let's see, originally they don't secrete anything at all. So let's set a maximum value of just one. Now let's plot this rule. So when a cell is alive, the dead signal is zero, well, dead is false. When the cell is dead, false, uh, dead is true, and we're one, and we kind of reach up towards that maximum rate. But I would like a much sharper response curve. So I'm gonna up the value of my hill parameter to 10. Now this is acting more and more like a, like a heavy site function. When we are at true over here, when the cell is dead, we'll have a very large release rate of debris. Now, the other important thing is we want this rule to apply to dead cells. So we click the apply to dead checkbox over here, and let's go ahead and save it and save all of our rules. And that's, that's it. Now we have this extra uh, rule that dead cells will release debris. So let's go ahead and click on run simulation and see what that does. So I'm gonna go here a little bit and let's change our substrate from oxygen, here's drug, and here is debris. And so you can see all these dead cells are all releasing debris. So there's an initial wave of cell death and they've all released some debris and over time it's spreading out in the environment. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. And so having this ability to turn rules on or off for dead cells uh, can be very, very helpful for this kind of scenario where you may want, in fact, to do more refined models like apoptotic cells may release properly encapsulated apoptotic debris, and then necrotic cells might just leak their contents, and you might call that necrotic debris. So have, actually, you can have more refined signals that define how this works. Okay, so now we can see, and let's turn our cells back on, that you know that initial bit of treatment created all the cell debris that now is diffusing into the environment, and the cells that are left over are remaining and starting to repopulate the tumor. And whenever you have a you know like a stochastic death event, that becomes another source of more debris in the environment. So now we're starting to make our way to a more a more interesting tumor model. And we can go ahead and run and visualize that. So now let's start adding in macrophages. They are truly the dump trucks of biology, but very interesting dump trucks because they have a lot of functions. And one of their, un their functions is to consume dead cell debris and to phagocytose dead cells that they encounter. So let's go ahead into the, uh, the studio. Let's go into cell types and let's click on the cancer type. And now we're going to just going to make another cell type. And I find it convenient just to copy that one. And we're going to double click and rename it to macrophage. And so for macrophages, I want them to just be really simple. We're not going to have any birth or death for them. So we're going to go here to the cycle tab for macrophages. Make sure you have the right one. Leave its cycle rate at zero. I'm going to set both of its death rates to zero. So we're just going to have a fixed population of macrophages when we get to it. So apoptosis and necrosis set them both to zero. Uh, let's make sure that macrophages are consuming the right thing. So we'll go to, more to, uh, to the secretion tab and we'll start with oxygen. The macrophages, uh, let's go ahead and keep them consuming oxygen. I think that makes sense. Uh, macrophages should not be consuming drug in this particular uh, model. So no drug uptake. Uh, but they should definitely be uptaking debris. So set the uptake rate to one for now on debris on macrophages. And macrophages should have some different mechanics than tumor cells. In particular, they should, they're very mesenchymal. They're very migratory. They shouldn't really have regular cell cell adhesion turned on. So I'm going to set the cell cell adhesion strength for macrophages to zero. And we're going to leave pretty much everything else alone. Other than that, macrophages 
are really designed to migrate and stretch and things. So I'm going to make them have a little bit larger of a mechanical interaction distance. So I'm going to set the maximum uh, mechanics distance. It's not just adhesion, actually, it's just for all mechanics to 1.5. This is a multiple of the cell's radius. So however big the cell is, if it has a 10 micron radius, this macrophage can reach out 15 microns, one and a half times the radius, because it's a relative distance. OK. And now we want macrophages to be motile. So let's make sure that we uh, have turned on motility for the macrophages. So go here into the motility tab. I'm going to leave them at one micron per minute. I'm going to, just for fun, change the persistence time to five minutes. So they go about five minutes before they choose a new direction on average. I'll leave the migration bias at 0.5, but let's make sure that we turn on uh, motility for the macrophages. And then in particular, we want them to do a random walk towards cell debris because they're searching for this. So I'm gonna turn on chemotaxis by checking this box. And then I'm gonna go down this drop-down menu and make sure that they're going towards debris. So now they are motile, in particular the chemotactic, and they're moving towards debris. Okay. The last thing we want to do now is, so these macrophages right now in our model are wandering the environment and they are not sticking to other cells, not by regular adhesion anyway. Uh, they are motile and they are consuming debris, but we need to now turn on phagocytosis so they can consume dead cells. So we go here to the interactions part of the cell definition. And here we can see that we have a handful of things to modify, but in particular, we want macrophages to phagocytose any dead cells that they encounter. So we go here to the dead phagocytosis rate. I'm going to give it a rate of 0 0.01 minutes. Now, 0 0.01 minutes, one over that is basically a waiting time. So this says that if a macrophage is in contact with something for uh, at least, you know, on the, if they've been in contact for 100 hours, they are very likely to have tried to facial cytosis. So you can even try experimenting with faster values and slower values, but that's not a terrible starting point for this particular model. So now the macrophages are wandering around consuming apoptotic debris, and whenever they come into contact with a, mac with a dead cell, they're going to uh, do some facial cytosis. And let's see here. Well, that's pretty good, but we need to do one more thing. We need to make sure we actually have some macrophages. So let's go to the initial conditions tab, and I'm going to change the cell type over here to macrophage. And let's do a random fill rather than a hex fill. We're going to place 100 macrophages between a radius of, let's say, between 250 microns and 300 microns. So just change these two plots. Now I've got a nice little ring of macrophages just outside the tumor. Click on Save, and we're, we should be ready to go. So let's go ahead and give that a go. Uh, let me see, are we missing anything? No, I think we're good. This is an unneeded set of slide. So let's go ahead and click uh, Run. And so now I can see that we've also added these macrophages. So let's go to that initial plot window. So here we can see we have the tumor and the ring of macrophages. And we can choose different substrates. Here's that drug. Here is debris. And let's just see how that works. So we'll go out a few tabs. So we can see that the macrophages are definitely chemotaxing towards and finding the dead cells in the debris, and they're consuming the dead cells. And I'm putting a little compression on the tumor, honestly. And once they have consumed all those tumor, uh, the dead tumor cells in debris, now they really don't have much of a signal to drive chemotaxis. So they're now doing more random migration through their environment. And so that is that. So we've actually made quite a lot of progress here. We have now a, a drug that we've introduced that causes this extra cell death. The extra cell death is releasing debris, and now the debris can attract macrophages and start building the beginning of our immune response. Uh, before I continue, are there any questions here? I, I do see one a uh, question from Azadeh in the, in the text about cell volume versus area. And it's a really good question. So I want to read it out loud to make sure people who are listening in on this can hear it. 
Uh, the question is, in 2D, instead of volume of cell, do we need to determine their area? And so here are the sizes of cancer cells and macrophages assumed to be equal. So there's, there's actually a collection of a few good questions. So first of all, um, it can be helpful to think about cross-sectional area of tumor cells or of any cell in the simulation. So let's go back to cell types and look in the volume tab. But remember that we actually, every 2D simulation is actually a very thin slice of 3D. It's like a, a projection on the plane. And so we still model the cells as having volume. They just all happen to have a Z equals zero coordinate. And so it's still a volume, uh, even though you're viewing the 2D projection of that. So that's that's the first thing. You can, however, convert that to an equivalent radius by taking, you know, fourth roots pi r cubed is equal to your volume, cube root, solve for your radius, and you've got the equivalent radius. And that's, in fact, what we do. So that's the, the first part, is that in 2D, you really don't need to worry about deciding to call it volume versus area. Um, but for if you're on the flip side, doing image processing, say from digital pathology or from uh, some other multiplex imaging, uh, the image you're getting is a 2D projection of your 3D cell or a 2D cross-section of your 3D cell, as the case may be. And so what you need to do is you need to kind of say, what is the equivalent radius of the cell that you found in your actual data? and then convert it to an equivalent volume, assuming you know, basically a sphere. So that's a really good question. You, you can relate the 2D and 3D, but it does require some caution if you're trying to relate it to some real life microscopy uh, and, and relating it to what you see in, in the images. The other question is about the sizes, and that is a really, really good question. Uh, you can actually give any cell any volume you want to, and there is no reason you have to assume that they're all the same volume. I just put the, the default values because I had no reason to change them, but that's not required. All cells can have individual volumes. And so in a refined model, you may want to make their sizes a little different. So let's suppose that a macrophage is a little bigger. Let's make it say 4,500 cubic microns. That's not a problem. And let's go ahead, oh, let's go ahead and just rerun the simulation now with those larger volumes. So we'll go back to this initial plot and you can see now that the macrophages are a little bigger than the tumor cells because we gave them a larger volume. And the, the framework can handle that just fine because look at these little tiny apoptotic cells, they're, they're very small in terms of volume. And so actually uh, non-equal values are very much fine in the framework. Uh, and it was a really good question. I thank you for giving us that opportunity. Uh, any other Paul, questions? Right now? Paul, could I add to that? Yeah, please, Randy. Slightly. If you do change the volume like you did there and have initial conditions that are hexagonally packed, you will have to go back and redo the hex packing, right? That is a really good point. I hope you all heard that. Um, just to kind of uh, reiterate that, the, the positions of the cells in these hex fills are based upon the, the size of the cell when you ran the, the function. So if you now have resized your function to make the cells bigger, for example, now um, they're gonna be very much overlapping in your initial condition because of the same positions that they had before. So you know, do, do work with caution. You're probably, your best workflow is to set your size before you worry about placement. Uh, and so that may take some iteration. So that was a really great point, thank you. This is really great. Um, let's see, let's see where we are. So now actually we've gotten some really good place here. Uh, let's go ahead and start adding some interesting things or do we dare go off script? We could go off script. I think we're gonna have plenty of time. I'll come back to that though. Let's go ahead and add a little bit more here. So what we're supposed to be doing now is adding hypoxic responses uh, to the tumor cells. And so the main idea is that we know the cancer cells change their behavioral phenotype uh, when they are in hypoxic or low oxygen conditions. Uh, one thing that we know that they do is that they decrease their cell cell adhesion because they become more mesenchymal. Uh, they increase their migration. They change their metabolism. And one other thing that they try to do is to try to call for the growth of, of blood vessels in a process called angiogenesis. So for today, let's not worry about metabolism and angiogenesis, and let's just work on these changes in migration and in cell adhesion to kind of get this EMT, this epithelial mesenchymal transition. 
And here we're going to run into the same, you know, the same uh, subtlety that we ran into before, that there's no such thing as a low oxygen signal in the language right now. But what we can do is we can reverse it and say, kind of think about how that response curve is going to look. And say, you know, we can't say that low oxygen increases migration speed, but you have this curve we say for low values of oxygen, you want high migration speed. And for high values of oxygen, you want low migration speed. So you can say that start with a high migration speed in the absence of any signals. And that as you increase oxygen, it decreases the migration speed. Similarly, uh, we don't say that low oxygen decreases adhesion. Instead, we want to say that there's low adhesion when the cells are in low oxygen conditions, more mesenchymal-like, and that as oxygen increases, you increase your adhesion. So you kind of just want to get the shape of that response curve in the way you write your rule. And so let's go ahead and add the hypoxic response to the cancer cells. So we're going to go here into the uh, motility tab. So we'll go here to cell types. We're going to go into motility. Make sure we're selecting the cancer cells now. And first of all, we want to turn on migration. So we turn on migration. I'm going to leave all the defaults. One micron per minute, one minute persistence time, half bias. And let's turn on chemotaxis. And this, that, these are tumor cells that are trying to escape their bad conditions. So they're going to go up oxygen gradients in particular. And so we're going to turn that on. And uh, let's continue building out the hypoxic response for this. Uh, now we need to turn on that base uh, value for adhesion. So let's go to mechanics. Now let's say that in the absence of signals, in the absence of oxygen in particular, the cancer cell is going to have a lower adhesion. So let's just dial it down by a factor of 10 to have 0 0.04 adhesion when they're in low oxygen values. And then when they escape those conditions, they will go back up to a higher oxygen value. No, sorry, higher adhesion value. So that's the change in the base values. And now let's go ahead and add the response curves. So let's go here to rules and make sure we choose that for cancer cells, that oxygen is going to increase. Uh, actually, let's do the motility rule first, I think, right? The migration speed. So oxygen will decrease migration speed. And we want to decrease it towards zero. And what are some decent values to use for that? I'm going to use a half max of seven and a half millimeters of partial pressure and a hill power of four. And let's plot our response curve. So we can kind of see that when oxygen starts getting lower, that they uh, start increasing the motility until once you get to very low oxygen values, they, they really increase the motility. So you know, that's probably reasonable. So let's go ahead and click on add that rule to make sure we have it and save. And now let's add our hypoxic response for the adhesion. So it's the same kind of thing that in cancer cells, oxygen is going to increase cell cell adhesion. So I type cell and I see cell cell adhesion pop up. And I'm just going to have uh, the exact way around that uh, at the same half max, basically reversing that response curve now, that you go back to the 0.4 adhesion that we had before. So you can see how. In low oxygen, we have very low adhesion, get towards seven and a half micron, uh, millimeters partial pressure, and eventually you start increasing towards your saturating value of adhesion up over here. So go ahead and add that rule. So you can see now we're starting to accumulate a good number of rules for our model. Let's go ahead and save that, and let's give it a go. And now I'm gonna actually go ahead and mess with these boundary conditions. So I'm gonna make oxygen really low on one side so you can really, really see um, what's going on here. So I'm going to click on run simulation. So let's see here. If I go just a little bit, you can see very low auction in the bottom boundaries and higher auction up here. And now let's take a look and see if we can actually plot a little bit to see that response. So let's look first. Well, actually, let's just play it first for a moment. So here we can see that the, uh, the tumor is kind of migrating en masse towards the higher oxygen conditions. So that's a good sign. And we can see that you know, whatever cells were dead before were, were definitely cleared out. So here we have this apoptosis everywhere from the drug. We have some necrosis here on the tail end like we had before. 
and the macrophages have eaten the cell debris, and now there's nothing left for them to find. The drug is really kind of washing out now. This looks like a large gradient, but look at the scale, right? It goes from zero to 10 to the negative 10. So it's basically zero everywhere. And then the debris, there's really not much for those uh, macrophages to find. If I can turn the cells off, there are a few spots for the cell death, but that's about it. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to actually visualize this by cell adhesion to kind of see how that rule is working. So I'm gonna keep going here and scroll down until I find cell, cell adhesion strain over here. And let's just plot that out. So you can see how these tumor cells, there's this gradient of cell adhesion strength. That here on the side with higher oxygen, they have higher adhesion. And on the side with lower oxygen, they have lower adhesion. So we can definitely see that EMT right here in the visualization. And likewise, we can go and take a look at the effect on the um, on the migration speed. So you can look for migration speed. We can see how, okay, so all the macrophages have a high migration speed. And here you see the exact opposite, right? Here the very well oxygenated tumor cells have a very low migration speed. They're basically not in the EMT. And then here are the tumor cells on the far side, but that lower oxygen have a high migration speed. And so they are trying to escape the bad conditions until finally they do reach higher oxygen and slow down the migration. So we have a really uh, a pretty solid EMT-like behavior in this model with not too much to do about it. Um, now, what I've noticed here is that we do have some migration of the tumor cells, even after they get out of the um, hypoxic regions. And what that suggests is that we probably need a steeper response curve so that when they're in hypoxic regions, they really respond. And when they're out of hypoxic regions, they really stop. So the easiest way to do that is to go back to the rules tab and find some of these rules. So here's oxygen that cancer oxygen decreases migration speed and our heal power is four right now. So you can actually click the rule and plot it. This software that Randy wrote is just absolutely brilliant. Uh, so here we have our response curve. So what I think we want to do is let's just make this steeper. Let's try a hill power of six and see the difference. See, now it's a much sharper drop off. And so I'm going to do that for both of these rules and just click, make sure we click on save. So we overwrite the rules file and let's rerun the simulation and see what the difference is. So we'll get to that initial picture. And we're plotting this by migration speed again. Actually, what we ought to see is a much sharper. So yeah, see how the tumor cells really stopped migrating much, much faster now, uh, especially as they get out of the hypoxic regions. And so this really gets a lot more localized. And so that is a nice adaptation. Now, another thing you may notice is that these macrophages are really kind of jostling the tumor cells around. So we were actually uh, where we meant to be on the slide. So we have a little bit of spare time. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna wing it a little bit. We're gonna add some new rules uh, just based upon what we see here. Uh, but one thing that we see is yeah, these tumor cells are kind of pushing the, I'm sorry, the, the macrophages are pushing the tumor cells around, which is a little goofy. Uh, and so one thing that we can do is we can add some negative feedbacks. So let's take a look and just play around a little bit. Let's just say macrophages. Let's add a rule that contact with any live cell makes them slow down their migration speed. And let's just see what happens here. So let's suppose that they're in contact with, I don't know, let's play around. Let's say two or more cells. So let's say uh, ramping up, you know, once they have at least two cells, they're starting to really increase this behavior. And they're going to decrease their migration speed towards zero. And this is not applied to that. Oops, I should have changed these rules. Let's plot this. So here we have macrophages now that when I'm in contact with no cells, I have my full motility. When I'm in contact with one cell, I've decreased my migration speed a little bit. Two cells, I'm down to half my original speed. Three cells, I'm down to just about a tenth of my speed. 
And four, I'm down quite a bit. Yeah, let's go ahead and add that rule. So we click add rule and we'll save it. So now when a macrophage comes in contact with a live cell, and actually we could add the exact same rule to say if I come in contact with a dead cell, maybe I'll slow down too. In fact, maybe they're happy to find a dead cell because that's what they're trying to eat. And so we might add that as a negative feedback. So let's go ahead and do that, contact with dead cell. And let's just say that even one dead cell makes them really slow down. So now we've shifted the response curve over to the left, right? That my half max is half the cell contact, which doesn't make sense. But what this does is says that by the time you reach one cell dead cell contact, you've really drastically reduced your cell migration speed. Let's go ahead and add that rule too and save it. Okay, and let's go ahead and run. So I think that's really the benefit of being able to add rules very, very easily is that we can try out new ideas and very quickly assess what the effect is. Uh, we can really explore and play with our hypotheses. So let's see what happens here. Let's go back to the SVG value for now. So here we see that the macrophages now, instead of pushing their way around and pushing the tumor, they basically stopped at the tumor boundary. And that's actually pretty fun. So we get a, a drastically different behavior with this extra mechanical feedback for the, for the macrophages. And if we go back to map and get the full list, we can plot migration speed and really see what the effect is of that. You see how the macrophages are really slowed down because they're parking on the tumor boundary just because of those extra feedbacks in, in the rule. So we have a lot of opportunity to, to really play and, and add new things. Do I have any, should I take special requests? Uh, you guys want to try any different rules here? I'm watching the chat window. Well, it's okay, we can do more of these later. So let's see. So now we have the macrophages zeroing in and, and finding things. We can change our plot to the drug, but it's basically zero everywhere. And then we can look at the debris and the macrophages are really doing a great job of clearing that out. You see how they're consuming the, the debris left over by the old dead tumor. And that is that. Now we can go ahead and do a few other things while we're at it. Why not? go and change our drug delivery. Let's go ahead and add some drug on the top, I'm sorry, on the right boundary. Let's say just a slower amount and just see what happens here. So we'll click on run again. And I'm gonna to go to the very beginning and choose drug for my visualization. So now you can see that we have that initial bolus of drug but we also have a bound, should have a boundary condition on the left edge here. I'm not sure it actually took. That to me looks like it didn't actually apply. So I think right now we're still having some parse errors on, oh, I forgot to click the on box. Well, this is a user error. So let me interrupt this and rerun the simulation. So basically I added a boundary condition for drug, but I forgot to do the checkbox to enable it. And so that was a mistake. So now let's go back and plot that drug again. And yeah, now we have that Dirichlet boundary condition on the right side only. And so we should see you know, some sustained death uh, on the tumor cells, particularly as they migrate towards, uh, so they're, the poor things are confused and heading towards their doom. Uh, but you know, on the other hand, there's food there, so maybe it's worth it. So you should see an increase in cell death, some cell apoptosis as the tumor starts to reach that, that source of drug on the right.
And so we can actually visualize the debris. It would be a great way to actually see where there's depth. So here we see the depth. And now there's a little bit more depth over here, causing this increase in debris as the tumor starts to grow towards that drug source on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the problem, even for this low value of drug. So actually turning the cells off and just visualizing debris is a good way to see where the drug is making it and where it's having an effect. So we're actually in a pretty good place. So uh, let's see here. So I'm seeing in the uh, chat a couple more questions. One question is only signaling proteins are substrates that diffuse based on what conditions we might consider as cells a substrate or only their size. Uh, so there are some great questions there. So Right now, we can treat um, diffusing substrates as signals. We can treat their gradients as signals. And we can also treat intracellular values as signals. And as for cells, right now, we don't treat cells as a continuum. We treat cells as discrete agents. But what you can do is treat contact with cells as a signal. And so you can say, for example, uh, the number of tumor cells you're in contact is a signal. And that should correlate with density, but is something that's a little bit easier for the cells to sense in this framework. Uh, so you can do that kind in particular. Now, if you want something that's more diffusible to be a cell-like figure, you could do something like a diffusible quorum factor that's released by the cells. And that will be proportional to the cell, both the cell shape, uh, sizes and the number of them and the local density. So that's one way you can get uh, a signal that looks more like cell density. But at this scale, we aren't really quite at continuum hypothesis on the cells. Uh, so we can have them release a form, you know, a form factor, for example, and, and that would do the trick. Uh, so I hope that helps. Um, and on, on what conditions might we consider a cell as a substrate? Yeah, basically, yeah, we can't treat them as a substrate right now, though. Uh, but you would instead look to say how many cells of a certain type am I in contact with? Uh, there are some workarounds if you want to get that continuum hypothesis, but it's a little bit harder at this scale. Um, so thanks for the great question. And then there's another question saying, is there some way to add stochasticity to a given rule along the different agents? For example, differing powers or maximum values. That is such a wonderful question and a possible model extension to the, to the language itself. Right now, all cells get the same rule. But I think there would be a really cool thing to do to actually have some kind of an extra attribute on the rule to say what kind of variability is there. And there could be some variability in, um, in for example, the maximum value in the Hill parameter and the half max. All of these could have some heterogeneity. And so I think a future version of the model could actually add either some stochasticity in the assignment of the values, or that could be a good way to say that we actually have some uncertainty in the value and actually then say that we have a notion of the mean value of the different response parameters, but due to uncertainty, we don't know what is exactly. So we could have every individual cell when it's uh, instantiated, make a random draw from that bucket. And so these are some really great ideas for an extension to the, the modeling language uh, in a future version. And I think it's a really, really good idea. Um, we could also think about making stochasticity in the way we respond to the parameters. That would probably take a little bit more work, but it is also possible. Yeah, that would be really fun. So we should think about that. I'd be very happy to talk more about that. Hey, Paul. Uh, Paul, back to the original, the other questions from Azade about signaling and cells. Oh, were there other uh, questions no, further? No, up? I, I was going to add to that. A am I correct in thinking that you could also incorporate and specify custom data as signals, it would require yeah, more you, effort. That's definitely true. If you have a custom variable, uh, and if you were to write your own C++-based rule to regulate that variable, then that could also be the input of, of a rule. Absolutely. And uh, for Khan, we'll give a, a, an optional session on integrating systems biology markup language, or SBML models. Uh, as models that can integrate in, and they can write extra variables that we could use in these rules. So that's another possibility. Huh, look at that drug. It is basically melting the right edge of the tumor as it grows towards that boundary. And the macrophages are just eating 
all that debris as they go. This is actually a very fun model. Um, yeah. Is there a way to add capacity rules to this? So I'm glad you brought that up, Shumik. Um, so one thing we can support is that we can use uh, SPML as our way of writing ODE models. And then we can interface them with Physicel using Live Roadrunner. So you can use Copacity to write SPML models of, of a specific form uh, that they do need to take things that we can send them as inputs to the SPML models and write things that we can interpret as outputs. So for a special class of SPML models, yes, we can do that. Uh, and so basically this modeling language is a way to uh, write some intermediate level of complexity models without writing any code uh, and without the complexity of solving SPML models. But if you want to integrate some SPML models, we can't support them all in the universe because it's too big of a universe to support. But we can use it as a way to write certain classes of models and integrate them into the agents. And there will be an optional session for that uh, later in the week. The other thing that you can do is you can have Boolean network models. And so Vincent Noel and his team will present Mobos and Physiboss later on in the workshop and present how to basically do the same kind of thing. So, you know, more or less, our, these rules here are kind of a, a high level way to get some of that behavior to say that these signals in the environment lead to some kind of observed behavioral change. But if you want to instead say that a Boolean network model or an ODE model is your signal processor, you can have the similar kind of architecture where you say, the SBML model or the Boolean network model reads some signals in the environment, does its own form of processing, and then comes up with its own determination of what the behavioral parameters should be. And that's the other kind of intracellular model that we can support. So this basically just kind of short circuit steps. Say, I have this observation and I build a rule off of it. And then Boolean networks and ODE models are a way to get a more mechanistic version of that if you have uh, the, the right way to drive that, that model construction. So not all capacity, but it is a way to write models that we can use. Uh, are there any other questions? So we're actually, again, a little bit ahead of where we expect it to be. Uh, and so I'm actually, I think what we can do is go ahead and stop the screen share. We can go ahead and stop recording now for comments.